when Hudson came up to me and said, I want to, I'd like to be on TV. The truth is he was like trying to impress a girl and it was a huge mistake. <laughs> Dang, I'll he's still got friends. Dang. Dang. No, no. Now we are outside of one of the most famous Chinese restaurants in the entire country, Newport Seafood. It's been featured on a whole bunch of shows and we got two very, very, very special guests. So we are talking about Melvin Marr, one of the main producers of the TV show Fresh Off the Boat. And we are talking about Jeff Yang, one of the most famous Asian pop culture writers and also the father of Hudson Yang. And don't worry, we're not gonna go easy on these guys. We're gonna be asking them some tough questions. Let's, Let's go. go. Wow. We should have brought another camera out. Oh, Seriously. Let's get into just introducing you guys. Yeah. Okay. Melvin Marr, Jeff Yang. Melvin, what do you do? Uh, I produce TV shows and movies. Fresh off the boat, Speechless, Jumanji. I'm from Vermont. Vermont. From Montebello. Most of the people I grew up with did what their parents told them to do and they became doctors. And it was like a long stretch where they were far more successful. There are moments where I was like, maybe I should have been a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I started out as a television critic, oddly enough. And then uh, I produced uh, A Son. I've had the, the uh, great fortune to write about and trace the outlines of Asian America as it has emerged. Uh, I launched a magazine back in 1989 called A Magazine, Inside Asian America. Was you were sort of like selling Asian American pop culture at a time where even Asian America was kind of like, I, I don't want that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I co-wrote Jackie Chan's autobiography, his first autobiography. Yo, yo! Yeah. <laughs> the reason that we did this talk is I think so often we, we're with actors and we're with people in front of the camera. There's this whole infrastructure behind it and you guys are all deeply Yes. In I, part I, I, or familiar with that infrastructure. I'm curious actually what the first pitch session for Fresh Off the Boat was like. It was actually not a crazy one because Notch, Notch Khan, who um, adapted and created the show for television, is like a genius. At the time, it was just so like unknown and unheard of that people were like, yeah, they're just a little afraid to like say anything about it. Is there a boat in the <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, what is this? Oh, okay, that sounds good. It wasn't until like, Dana Waldman sort of keyed into what it was and she called me and said, I love this and we're gonna make it. At the end of the season, it'll be 101 episodes and it's 100 more than I thought we'd ever make. For multiple decades, I had been providing a, a space for Asian Americans to be Asian American public. I remember in the 80s and, and, uh, and 90s, when I was covering Asian American actors and writers, a lot. The Russell Wong era. <laughs> you look at Ming-Na Wen. Oh, you know? she doesn't age. None of the uh, oh, Tamil no. Tamina. Oh. She yeah. could Thank get you. it. During that era, you would ask uh, Asian American performers and creators uh, about what it means to be Asian American. A lot of them would actually sit back and say, you know, I'm an Asian American oh, thanks, writer thanks. in the sense oh. of a writer who has to be Asian American. Oh, oh, oh. But they would push back on the idea that Asian Americanness was something that was necessarily core to what they did right. or who they were. Literally until 2018, Asians were denying that being Asian had anything to do with the way they lived their lives in Western civilization. It, Isn't that weird? It's, 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 How come it seems like you were on it maybe 30 years earlier <laughs> than 10 years old? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah. Right before the era when Asian Americans basically became a dominant force on student campuses, we, we launched a student publication mm -hmm. um, at Harvard, which ended up becoming kind of the core. Like those people who worked on that ended up joining forces with me in, in launching what will become the magazine. And the reason why we well, did basically was, you started you know, subtle Asian traits yeah. 40 years <laughs> right. prior to that. When you look at subtle Asian traits today, uh, I'm, I'm just am amazed that people find these things still kind of relevant, amusing, and interesting because we were talking about that shit like 20 years ago. You need a critical mass of people who are woke to what you're trying to do, but you don't need so many people there that it seems like old news. And that's why I'm not surprised that, like, fresh off the boat, Eddie Huang came out of New York. You know, he's not from out here, he's from out there. He had a story he could tell, and the reason why I think he was inspired to tell it is because his experiences came out of a place where he wasn't the majority population, where he did experience friction and resistance, and that's the kind of thing which I think uh, inspires people to push back and to create stories. Uh, obviously, compared to Jeff, that your Asian awakening came later. Yes. Or you're much later. Because I think it, for me it was a... Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood in Montebello where I was the only 
Chinese kid on the, on the street. But to me, the sort of Asian American awakening was very, it's like a very personal thing. Like, I, I didn't, I was not thinking as big as Jeff. You know? <laughs> I got a little older, I started working, you know, and I started seeing my parents, like, age. You know, years later, I remember reading this book, um, and it was on my honeymoon, actually. I read this book by Iris Chang called uh, The Chinese in America. And I have to say, like, maybe it's the Mind Valley Unified School District, but I just didn't know the story of, like, Chinese people immigrating to America. And it was something that sort of, like, really connected everything for me. But I thought she was brilliant, and I had to just, like, write this note there and say, like, thanks for, you know, connecting all the dots with me. People are showing up. I, I get so excited now when like you hear about like an Asian American person that like you've never heard of. Right, yeah, like great. you think it's crazy <laughs> yeah. that you don't know her because there was a time where it was, it was a time you knew everybody. Because I always said that I thought CR, the whole CRA thing. Yeah, like, yeah, I thought that was gonna be five years ago for sure. I I've been thinking that this thing was gonna happen like every five years for like the last twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first time everybody thought that it was finally gonna happen. Uh, an Asian American show on, on network television. You talking about Margaret Cho? I'm talking about Margaret Cho and All American Girl. The first review I was asked to write was on All American Girl. You know, I knew Margaret. Um, and we were friends in that way that like the five Asian Americans who actually are kind of in that space are friends, right? But, and I told my editors like I don't feel comfortable writing this review because I'm concerned. I you know I'm confident. I want, I want the show to succeed. And and he was like, well, look, this is your first big opportunity. You can choose not to do it. But at some point, you gotta decide whether you want to be friends with celebrities or to do a professional job. Watched the show. Amazing. And I ended up writing this like really bad review. I was the only Asian American, you know, with a regular TV beat at the time. She called me up the next day and she was like, I saw your review. And, you know, she like tore me a new one. She said, You don't understand, it's not that it's a negative review. We've gotten a lot of other negative reviews. The fact that it's coming from you, an Asian American with a platform, uh, makes a huge difference because when they cancel our show, they can throw this on the table and say, even your community doesn't support it. That will be the killing blow. I'm like, that's not possible. But then 19 episodes later, it's that more or less that happened. People who are not involved in the industry, a lot of them sit back and say, oh man, why don't you just put more Asians in your shows? Why don't they just do this and this and make it, they make it sound so easy. <laughs> sure, absolutely. We should put more Asians on TV. We should put more Asians in everything. Right? But it's but not like, as simple as like, no. hey, replacing this character with an Asian face. Like, it's, it's, it's got a test in our base. Well, it's, no, well, <laughs> that's part of it. There's, that's one of the variables. It's a bunch of things. I think it's like, they're two separate, uh, work streams here, right? How do we get more Asian Americans out there, period, mm -hmm. in stuff, right? That I actually think is an act of will. Hey, look, it's never been about lack of talent, it's always been about lack yeah. of opportunity. If people actually chose to, they could have cast Asian Americans in many more roles. Mm -hmm. That's a separate conversation though, which I think brings up the question of, of fresh off the boat and, and Melvin's uniquely humble approach to it, you know, for, for fresh off the boat, again, it was the first, it really was, to make that work. And there was a cascade effect afterwards. There was a shifting of the direction of the flow of Hollywood. I mean, I, you were at the center of that. And uh, I think history will look back and say, this was a moment that changed the course of our community. My philosophy has always been like, keep your head down and just get it on the air, or get it made and get it, get it up, get it released. Yeah. Like that's the, I guess that's a little bit of like my parents' thought, mm -hmm. which was just like, Keep your head down and work hard, you know? They, for the first time, really acknowledged that this was necessary because they all of a sudden saw people around them saying, we're watching something on TV we've never seen before, and it's us. We're seeing ourselves. Yeah. And I, I didn't know that I needed it until I saw it. Exactly. Well, that's what a lot of people said about CRA too, right? They're like, damn, why am I getting this weird feeling? <laughs> oh, I'm being humanized in this country in media, and that wasn't even something that I thought I cared about. Who's like a lot of the people watching Fresh Off the Boat? Because you're competing with Netflix, you're competing with YouTube and Instagram, for at least for the kids. Maybe market. Even like what I've been told, I've, I've heard Netflix. a lot. I mean, obviously, um, the Asian American audience is, is huge for us, as well as the African American audience. Jeremy Lin was really funny at the time he was on. He looks really funny. All my teammates come up to me all the time and say like, yo, is your mom really like that? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, yeah, we go on road trips and like all the guys on the team just like binge it. <laughs> I was like, that's cool. Corey Brewer told me that was yeah. his favorite show. I said, all right. The top three shows for Asian Americans, like what they were watching in the first season, 
uh, were all episodes of Fresh Off the Boat. If you actually looked at the other way, who's watching Fresh Off the Boat? I mean, the, actually, the, the plurality is still white because you know, the white audience is, the, you know, African Americans were second, Asian Americans yeah. were third. But I had a funny story about this. Eric Liu, a friend of mine, who um, you know runs this group in Seattle, invited me up you once. Know, you guys know Eric, right? I do know Eric. Yeah. Big burly white guy comes up to me and goes, "I love your show." So oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I go, "Oh, awesome!" And he was like, "You know, I'm so I forget his name, but he was like the head of the Democratic Party in Seattle or something like that." And then without skipping a beat, I go, "Oh, so is your your wife or your uh, partner Asian American?" Well, the best part is he looked at me and was like, "No." Why, why, why? And I was like, I'm really sorry. I completely just stereotyped. No, he's like, no, I just love it. Like, uh, just, a, just a big white family in Seattle. And I was like, yep, I'm an asshole, I'm sorry. It's funny because the discussion has changed, but you know, for a while, maybe even, I'm not saying Jeff did, but, but he might have, might have called you like for a number of years in your career. Like, I mean, I mean, a lot of people have called me a lot of uh, worse things in, in my career. And then I always look at it this way, which is like, if I, if I believe in it and I'm passionate about it and I believe in someone's vision, in this case, I believed in Eddie's vision of that cast of actors, I would have done anything possible to get it on the air. I actually feel strongly that uh, call-outs of sellouts are a mistake. One of the things that I became very aware of was in, we need more, not less. We need more voices. And the way to actually address, if you don't like something, support something else, right? Don't tear down that thing. You can give a critique, you can try to make it better. If you kill all the vegetables coming out of your garden, you will eat lean for a long ass time. <laughs> when I hear things on Twitter or read things about me or read things about the products you guys make, I do think a lot of those people kind of enjoy hating on things. Yeah. And they're not necessarily creating an alternative project. And if those people did create an alternative yeah. project, I would support it. And I just see that a lot on Twitter from a lot yeah. of Asians in particular. No, I, like, I, I and their, their whole feed is just negativity towards anything. Like we've gotten it. Um, yeah. Wang Fu gets it. Every, anybody who's been doing it gets it. Creating something at this level or just like from the infancy level, being an artist or being whatever it is, is not something that I think culturally, for me, where I grew up like seeing or being encouraged to do that. Do you feel any responsibility to take care of and or, or help them gain representation that won't have that? Because if you look at the groups that are kind of getting on right now, yeah. Uji what Koreans are getting on and then Taiwanese in general, which kind of tend to be kind of a bougie group, in general, are getting off online. South Dude. Asians too, I mean, yeah. think yeah. about it, like, as Hindu, Hindu, sorry. Sp yeah. Specifically, Brahmin class South Asians. Yeah, I don't see Punjabis with that term of getting But I, I, don't, I don't look at it as somebody who spends a lot of time trying to figure out, like, the next television show or the next movie or the next whatever. It, it's To me, it's about the story and the point of view. So whether it's, like, Punjabi or uh, Hood Asians or whatever you're saying, it, it's, it starts with a story and a point of view. Like for Speechless, it was like, you know, after Fresh Off the Boat had been on a year, they were like looking for the next family show. And Scott Silveri, who you know created the show, uh, grew up in Yonkers, you know, Italian American family, and his family was not like his family. And, and if you watch that show, it's not about like an upper middle class family. They're always you know blue collar jobs, everything, and it's a show about like a kid who has cerebral palsy, you know, and and. To me, that was a very distinct point of view. What I'll say is this, I have the luxury, because I'm not on the inside, of literally feeling that way. That is, uh, I don't have to actually go out there necessarily and make the story or find the story. I can advocate for those things from the outside. And I'm, I do feel, frankly, that, uh, you know, one of the big challenges with inclusion you know, across the board is that it's easy to sort of say, we've done it, we've been there, we're good, let's move on. We are in the kind of a weird place right now where post crazy occasion, searching, 12 boys love. So we've seen certain stories out there. They're distinct and new and interesting stories, but Hollywood works in a certain way. If something works, they're like, let's find the five things that are exactly the same as that thing with one tiny change. It's gonna be crazy witch Asians, and they'll be like, you know, there'll be a family of witches. That's you a good know, idea. <laughs> Do you think, Jeff, that privileged East Asians, do you think they care about the non-privileged Asians? I guess my answer to that is no, but it's not necessarily in a malicious way. It's just in Asian culture, if you look at it, it's very hierarchical. Nobody cares about anybody who's doing worse than no, I'm them. gonna go. I'm gonna go harder on that. I'm gonna say that I do think we have a huge problem in Asian America with privileged individuals mm -hmm. uh, just totally shitting on those who are less privileged, even within Asian America. At, you got to begin with some stories and. Um, 
I will say this, the most exciting stories that I've been seeing and reading outside of film and television more recently have been coming from Southeast Asian community. Um, it was a much more different experience. Well, it's like, okay, in theater, for instance, right? Viet Gong, uh, Cambodian rock band. Yeah. These are two modern classics that are created in distinctive story frames mm -hmm. that are uniquely Southeast Asian mm -hmm. coming out of history, but these are not historical. I mean, they're historical, but they're funny as hell. They're, they're musical. Mm -hmm. That shit is gonna pay off. I mean, mm -hmm. these stories are there. But you're right, we as Asian Americans have to think beyond the fresh off the boat yeah. and create Asian in order for some of that stuff to happen. Yeah. Do you, like, <laughs> if we crack that right. code, one, one, <laughs> one, do you agree that in general Asian, full Asian dudes are considered black in America socially, not, not professionally? What role does media have to play in changing that? Or yes. is it more on the people? I do agree with that that has been the stereotype. And like, I remember saying to Johnny Davis, who is our executive at 20th TV, he was like, he said to me, you can do anything in second position. And I was like, okay, I would like to do a show. Basically, the kernel of an idea was an Asian American male. I mean, I mean, and, and at the time, I was even thinking like, cool. you know, I, I want to, you know, develop something for John Cho, because like, that dude is good <laughs> fucking looking, right? Like, like I was like, how do you, you Ironically, know? he was in selfie, the spot that Fresh Off Boat would eventually take. That's right, <laughs> like, ironically. Yeah. But like, yeah. but that was the, that was the kernel of the idea, because I, I, I do, believe and I do agree that that has been the stereotype. Is it changing? Absolutely. Uh, Stephen Young, sorry, not Daniel. Stephen Young on, uh, you know, um, Walking, Walking Dead. Dead. Like, he's a badass and he's awesome. And like, it, it's shifting away from that. And and it is something that like, was, uh, at, you know, at its purest form, a motivator for me in, in terms of developing something and, and looking for a project. If you think that aspirational representation is just about like bougie upper classness and everything. Yeah, it, it is that, but it's also like we want to be seen as hot, and we want you know we want those guys with the cut abs and the high cheekbones to represent Asian America. Media has quite unfortunately uh, highlighted you know at a pretty atrocious perspective, pretty atrocious, atrocious view of what Asian American maleness looks like. I'm not sure the answer is to necessarily flip the, the switch and say, okay, we're only going to put our perfect genetic specimens like in your front of the camera. Yeah. Yeah. The single biggest breakthrough that we're going to see in terms of romantic comedy, it is Randall and yeah, Allie's romantic great. comedy that's coming out from Netflix, Always Be My Maybe. I haven't seen it yet. Randall, Randall and Allie, like, not necessarily supermodels. Yeah. Not exceptionally, not I mean, on that tier. I'll look. say this. They're both really hot. <laughs> <laughs> I love they them are. both. They're what has friends. Randall been working out? What's been going on? <laughs> that, oh, he was yeah, actually he, funny. he is like a silent workouter. Yes. The thing that you will see when the when the movie comes out is they are three dimensional characters, and it's not about like what they look like yeah. or whatever. It's it's about the story and the journey that their characters are going through. Are the Asian kids becoming so comfortable in their skin that they're not doing the work enough? that's gonna push. Like, all right, so when I go to college and I speak, and I'm talking to a lot of 18 to 22 year olds, I'm just like, listen guys, being Asian now for you guys is even more comfortable than it was even for me. And then for me, I was I look at the 40 year olds and the 50 year olds, I'm like, yo, it's way better to be me. <laughs> so it's, it just keeps getting better and better. But are, is there some fear that the young kids are just gonna stay on Instagram, live a fun life, go to festivals? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not all the way over on the like, do what you want to do, live how you want to live yeah. in the world. I'm, 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 I'm you know, Melvin's seen it. I, I, Hudson's I, going I, to college. We, we, <laughs> you say Hudson's going to college. We will turn into our parents. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's already it's happened. A little bit more. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Because there was a moment where we were shooting um, Speechless in London, and Chris Gernon, who directed the episode, we put, um, Penny and I were in, uh, in the scene, and at the end of it, yeah, and at the end of it, Penny, uh, she's sitting there and then Chris goes, do you want to be an actor, Penny? And she goes, no, I would like to be a doctor. I'm like, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This well, is you know, that's just, that's just for rebellion, right? It's like, it's like thank God. <laughs> because, you know what? Because you know what my dad was just telling me about? He was still convincing me and Andrew the other day to try to go back to school. <laughs> well, he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, he's like, you guys are like superstars, superstars. You know, you just did okay. Because you know how like he was, he was trying to tell me about STEM professions. He was like, 
you know the reason that like Asians we love stunt profession because there is a right and a wrong answer. He's like he's like Hollywood is all about story and people like your story. That's it. And he goes people generally don't like uh, like, yeah, like too yeah, subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like people don't like Asian it, it, well, guy it's not, story. It's not, he's like Asian guy story. People don't like it. Why would you go into a game that doesn't want Asian guy stories? You're an Asian guy. That seems like a horrific move. That that goes to the what makes you happy. And you want to do this because it makes you happy, right? And same for me, which is uh, I learned very early on, uh, in, uh, on top of not being smart enough, like just, I don't want to be in the medical profession. I didn't want to be an architect. I trained to be an architect. I didn't want to do that. And it took me a long time to figure out what I love doing. And I love doing this. And it's as simple as that. That's the, that's the conversation with your father. Because when he's like, talking about it objectively the way he is. Sure, makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, he doesn't have to live your life. You gotta be happy with yourself. You wanna wake up every day and like be excited about what you're gonna do, whether you fail or succeed. I, I really, I not only agree, that actually happened, right? Where when Hudson, who had never shown any interest in performing whatsoever, yeah. you know, came up to me and said, I wanna, I'd like to be on TV. I wanna be an actor on TV. I would look at him and was like, what are you talking about? You don't like, you don't even want to play piano. You know, you never performed anything. The truth is he was like trying to impress a girl and whatever, I'm, I'm just gonna back him on that. So- Tell me he got her. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it was a huge mistake. Oh, right? Dang, he still got friends. Dang. No, 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 what happened was like, after he actually got cast for the pilot, you know, he's like, comes back to school and everything. And uh, everybody's like, oh my God, I can't believe you're gonna be on TV. This girl's like, I ne never talk to him again. It's like. You overshot, dude. <laughs> you got like just, you know, uh, got a commercial or something. It's fine. But something more related. Showed her up. You know, he's you white. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he 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 said you want to do this, and I said, look, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. Uh, not only am I not going to, I I can't, right? I mean, I fought that fight for myself. I'm fighting that fight, so you can say you want to do this, right? Uh, but I will tell you that I have a lot of Asian American friends who are actors and. They're really good bartenders. You know, it's like you're you're an Asian American, you're male, you will have your pick of shitty roles, <laughs> but you'll be fighting the good thousands fight. and thousands of other actors who are in your same boat. Okay. You'll see them again and again in auditions. One out of a hundred auditions, you might get a callback, one out of a hundred callbacks, you might get, you know, to play a third waiter from the left. It is a bad life. But some people make it, and if you love it enough and work hard enough at it, mm -hmm. you can succeed and I'll support you all the way if you want to. Fast forward a couple months later, after all this has happened, you know, this like crash of the boat, blah, blah. He's like, Dad, I, I thought you said it was gonna be hard. <laughs> it's like, hey, you, you just it. ruined <laughs> hours of, of parental attempt. The fact is it was hard though. Cause like, even after he got the role, he had a lot of growing to do and yeah. I guess, uh, what's the one thing as we wrap this up, what's the one thing, let's say for example, you know, cause me and Amber go to colleges and a lot of people ask us questions about, being outside of the box of being Asian American. Both you guys have made a successful career outside of the box. Mm -hmm. oh. Conventionally, a lot of them will enter STEM fields. Some won't. Mm -hmm. They're worried. What is is your thing the happiness thing? Because I, 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 I think it's the happiness thing. More than more than anything else. It's just what do you want to wake up every morning and do? If you, if you wake up every morning and you're like, you know what, I want to make sure everyone has the right glasses. Go be an optometrist. Like do it. It's, it makes you happy. Like uh, for me, it was just like I, I didn't wasn't happy until I figured out what I wanted to do, and it was going to be hard. But I, you know, stuck with it. Every every place you are, you are someone. You are somebody who represents certain things. You know, whether that be your community, your identity. You're talking about just even in public life. In, in public life, like, in whether you got a camera on you. You know, it could be you, whatever profession you're doing, whatever space you occupy. Just showing people that you can speak up and speak out, mm -hmm. and and be somebody who is worth listening to. That's important. Loving what you do is important, but loving it also in a way to not be afraid to have that on your outside. That's the thing which I think Asian Americans maybe have been most challenged with. They need to be vocal about who they are and what they represent, what we represent. Do you think it is fair for Asians to come from the East to a Western country like America and be generally pretty much disengaged from media, voting. A lot of them are. A lot of them are and a lot aren't. Be engaged with it. Like, like figure out a way to like make, because that's how this country works, right? My, my family, um, you know, struggled to get here. They immigrated here and like, it's my duty. It's my like respect to them to be a part of this. I am an American and I may look like this and there are people in this country who don't 
think I'm American, but they're wrong. I'm American, <laughs> you know? And I, I need to do my part. Would you, would you be, go so far, and some Asian activists would like to create unhappiness in the people who don't want to be That's engaged I, I, as a way to encourage I, I them. I would not go that far. Okay, because, you would not want because to. I, because I do think there's a fine line of like, it's your right in this country to not be engaged at all. Like, right? It, it's like- Or be engaged should, just to the levels that you, you right. want, to whatever, whatever level. level it is. And, and do I uh, agree with you? No. Uh, I, I think you should be engaged. I think you should participate. And I think that that is a, that, that is a right that like, if you looked around and looked at the motherland or looked at every other place, you don't have the right to vote in other places. It's just not given to you. And, and this is like an amazing opportunity here in this country to do that. So do it. But if, you know, I'm not gonna create unhappiness for you and force you to do it, because then that goes against the whole idea. And, and right? I don't wanna just... I'm, I'm uh, on the side of making people unhappy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, look, because my business is not selling happiness. My business is telling uh, a different kind of story and, and pushing people. And, and maybe getting people uncomfortable. You do have the right to opt out of uh, the responsibilities and opportunities afforded to you by living in a country where uh, the, the very kind of fundamental aspect of being here is to be engaged, mm -hmm. civically engaged, politically engaged, and ultimately you know, engaged in conversation, right? Mm -hmm. You have the right to opt out of that. But if you opt out of that, you do not have the right to complain about That's what right. you get after. That's right. Whenever it comes down to the same thing. I failed to pick up my clothes and therefore they didn't get washed so I can't wear them tomorrow. I did not do my homework and therefore I have to wake up super early and I can't go to this show I wanted to go to. You know what, if you did not make your bed, you did not get to sleep, you know? If you do not take the responsibility to, to participate, you won't get the rewards of participation. America expects a lot of immigrants, right? That's why we get this bullshit narrative going on all the time about how immigrants come here and take everybody's, you know, the spoils of Americana without whatever, whatever, whatever. The truth is, if you're born in this country, you get everything without having to pay it. You never had to take a citizenship mm -hmm. test. You never, you know, you may pay taxes and all that stuff, but the reality is you have every, from birth, every reward of being American, public schools all the way up through to, you know, great highways you can drive on here in LA. And you never had to actually struggle, by and large, to, to get those things. Those are baked into your Americanness. If you're an immigrant who came here, you came from somewhere else which didn't have those things. You had to earn your way to America. And you know what? Those are the people who, frankly, I think tend to believe in what it means to be American even more. What one major takeaway about where this whole Asian movement is going? Where, real quick, where do you predict it's going? I guess, um, you know, I hadn't had this analogy until you kind of said it, Jeff, like the door's open and all Asians are in a line. Obviously, some of us are more on the front of the line, yeah. some of us are in the back of the line. I just hope that people in the front of the line care about people in the back of the line. And if the door were to ever close, they prop it open with their arms because they're already in there. And, and I, I, well, to, what you're saying is right. And I think time will tell what will hash. And, um, you know, I, I think um, what's exciting about it is a lot of things are being followed. You know, and, and I think you have to go with that. And I think part of it is you also have to be patient. You know, it's not gonna happen overnight. None of it has happened overnight. And if you look at the history of these things, it's never been immediate and that's okay. You have to, you have to stick with it. An agent Tom Strickler once said to me, you know, years and years ago, that it is a marathon and you just have to stick with it. It's not a sprint. And if you think of it that way, you're just gonna, you know, uh, burn out really quickly. To Melvin's point about a lot of things being pollinated right now, you may not like the one thing that's in front of you. You may not be a fan of Fresh Out the Boat. You may yeah. not have enjoyed Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. But there's a lot of other shit that's coming along now, yeah. right? And you love something. Yeah. You, should, you will love something. You need to love something because this is what you fought for, right? I mean, you know, we talk about stuff that could never happen, you know, 40 years ago. Well, you know, maybe the biggest example of that to me is that uh, Justin Lin. Uh, is finally making Warrior, which is Bruce Lee's, you know, storyline that he imagined and could never make in Hollywood before his death, right? And uh, he and the, the Lee family, you know, have kind of ex taken this story uh, in homage to uh, this dead icon of ours, Bruce Lee, and, and brought it to life. That's happening now and it's possible, but it's possible because finally that door is open. I think that, you know, if, if I had anything to say to Asian Americans, it's, you know, okay, you can, you can afford apathy. It is your 
luxurious right, if you choose to, to do nothing. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do nothing, if you do something, the rewards are so much greater. Yeah. And, and they're not just for you, it's for all of us. Yeah. There's gonna be a lot of Asian projects that come out. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna be for everybody. Yeah. And they're probably not gonna be all good. Yeah. And they're probably not gonna be all successful Absolutely. as yeah. the couple uh, home runs that we've had recently. And this comes from a creator who has been blasted on the internet a few times. We can take the blast, but we wanna know that you guys are out there supporting something. Like if I know that all those Redditors or those Twitter accounts are also supporting other things that are making a movement, I will feel better about it. You know, it's you need analyzers, you need attackers, but you need people to just support. You need an audience. <laughs> you need an audience. That's the other A. Thank you so much for watching this very special episode of Fun Bros Food. Thank you so much. To Melvin Barr, shout out to Jeff Yang for coming out here. I mean, make sure just uh, just let us know what you thought of the discussions in the comment section below, and make sure you let us know one project that you would like to see come to life in 2019. All right, everybody, thank you, and until next time, we out. Peace. Peace.